Hello and welcome to One on One on Plus TV Africa. Here in the studio is Reginald Bassi. He's the co-founder and director of business of Watchmen System Solutions Limited, an African technology-driven asset management company. Thank you for joining me in the studio. Thank you so much. So tell me, what exactly do you do at Watchman Securities? Well, I'm the director of business, okay. and um, we started the business um, early part of this year because we recognized the need for organizations, companies alike, and even government in the public sector to leverage the use of technology to mm -hmm. enhance the delivery of services. Um, and so we felt that the world has afforded us modern technologies, modern tools um, that we can use to sort of leapfrog part of those of us in this part of the world, leapfrog us from where we used to be to where we ought to be to become sort of evenly competitive around the world in terms of how we offer our business and services. So that's mm -hmm. why we started the company. I mean, I, these days you really can't talk about technology without talking <coughs> about the emergence of artificial intelligence, which has really been around for quite some time. Yeah. Help the common man who is watching this and has no clue whatsoever what AI is about. Help them understand what it is. Artificial intelligence. I mean, it's, it's a word that's become sort of a buzzword, but I mean, like the term, probe the term itself, intelligence. Intelligence is a feature of humans. So one of the features of a human being is that there is intelligence, the capacity to make decisions intelligently. So when it is artificial, it means that a different route to achieving the intelligence which humans have. So um, with the rise of computers and computing power, mm -hmm. um, developers have found a way to sort of help um, non-animate systems or inanimate systems mm -hmm computers, you know, or whatever it is that's, you know, has computing power to make decisions. And that's where artificial intelligence comes in, the capacity for machines, non-human actors, to intelligently make decisions. Um, so that's where artificial intelligence, so that at its primary level, that's what artificial intelligence means. Now we can take that and apply that to different aspects of life, and then you see how AI sort of interplays with different activities of human existence. Today. So just like the humans are able to take in information, <coughs> process it, so these particular machines, whatsoever, in any form it comes in, it's now its ability to interpret data interpret. and then make decisions based on exactly. all of those. Exactly. Not just even make decisions. Mm. Plan. Plan it, process the information, mm. make decisions, and then give feedback as well. Okay. Just so, like the humans Just do. like humans can do. So well, as, as time goes on, the capacity for artificial intelligence to influence these kinds of things increases gets better and better. Um, and that's where we'll come to other things, talking about what powers AI these mm -hmm. days, um, so that you, people understand you know, what's driving this. Yeah. Now we see regions like Canada, for example, taking over the whole you know, AI. They are not joking when it comes to both research in yeah. AI and all of that. Do you see Nigeria positioning itself such that it's in line with where the future, because this is the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the, the interesting thing about technology is that technology helps societies or nations sort of leapfrog from an obsolete system or an analog system to the future or to where they ought to be. So yes. it bridges those gaps quickly. Um, but Nigeria, we, we have peculiar challenges in the sense that there's a certain framework that ought to exist that helps a country drive its technology outputs mm -hmm. or drive its technology processes. So there, there's a framework that needs to exist, and which is one thing that is not exactly well addressed here. The framework for it, in other words, what is taught in the schools, you understand, what, how, how are science is taught in the school, what's the emphasis on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, um, what is the STEM. curriculum, the STEM, mm -hmm. what is the mm -hmm. curriculum um, like in the universities? I mean, so what is the focus of the country in terms of its policy to, uh, what's the vision of the country to drive change in certain sectors and then what because technology is really an enabler you understand it simply enables a decision which you've made so if the country hasn't clearly articulated its vision in terms of what it wants to be as a country then it becomes a problem to adopt technology else you bring in technology to a chaotic system and it can't help you achieve much you understand just like we had the insurgence of the um, gsm telecommunications the, yes. the whole system um mobile phones the you know just the pervasiveness of mobile phones now um if you look at it, yes, it's influenced and impacted on society in terms of its social economics benefits, but then you can't really say that this is the real impact it has had 
on society, measurable impact is had in society. You can have all kinds of data. But if we had a plan, we had a vision, a clear cut vision of where we wanted to go as a people or as a country, then we would leverage that technology yes. to influence how we achieve those goals. And so I think that's where we are still lacking behind the clearly articulated plan or vision for the country in terms of where it wants to go the number of years in a measurable way so that now we can bring in these new technologies, modern technologies, and then um, enable that process to get there. Because in my opinion, I actually feel that while the, you know, the government is working towards having a vision for our education system, they should incorporate and ask these private sectors that are making use of these technologies such that they are now teaching you know, the undergraduates and those in schools the what is necessary in their industry so that they come out and become employable at the end of the day. It's, it's a critical conversation to have because um, prior to this time, sort of 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. we could accept the traditional approach to education, which is um, go through the theoretical process, yes. you know, get people to have a wide appreciation of knowledge, and then you begin to specialize. But today, the demands of the world, the world of work, is very different. So it now warrants that the approach to education ought to change. So of literally, course. you can have kids who come out of secondary school and can <laughs> become programmers and influence and can even bring down a whole country because they have the skill and the tools to do so. Um, and so it tells you that education has fundamentally changed. So we also must respond to those fundamental changes, mm -hmm. which is something that we are still grappling with. We are still trying to put new wine into old wine skins, and that's a problem, you understand? And so what we are having is just a mishmash of activities going on in all the sectors because there is no targeted approach to achieving things here. So there needs to be a fundamental conversation about how we want our education to be, in fact, what is the goal of the country, and then we address our education system, address our healthcare and all the other sectors so that we can now use the appropriate technologies to enable these systems to achieve our goals as a country. I mean, I just thought to chip that in, but let's talk about where you specialize in, which is in, you know, drones, robotics, CCTVs. People are, some people are scared, quite a number of people are scared that these technologies will take over their jobs. And at the end of the day, they're just sitting and they're watching robots do what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah. Well, I mean, if I cast people's minds back, you know, you had a whole generation of persons who were trained as typists secretaries, you know, so they use typewriters and all that I stuff. I use typewriters. Use typewriters, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I never, never, I never let out the type, but, you know, <laughs> but people did that. Um, but the issue is now, you had that generation of persons, a lot of persons had trained themselves to cross over with the change mm. in society, change in technology and all that, um, while there were a couple of persons who didn't and so they fell out of favor. So nobody wanted to, they were no longer employable. So to so those kinds of persons, yes, your jobs will be taken over. But for those who want to keep a life of continuous learning, then you will, all you would realize that technology enables all you basically can do like is that. to retool yourself, rekit yourself, and then get ready for. Now, your basic knowledge which you have, your qualification, really gives you an advantage to decide how you want to now hone that craft into something else. If you don't have any skill, then you are in trouble. But if you have a skill, basically what you now need to do is to retool, rekit, and figure out, okay, with the new technologies, how can I reposition myself? So yes, the rise of AI, um, technology, robotics, and all that is really influencing the way work is done. And a lot of persons will get thrown out of the labor market because they haven't retooled themselves or rekitted themselves. So the decision is really on the individual to decide, how do I want to get updated? You know, even the systems which we all create today, they get updates. Why? Because, you know, things change, you understand? So you've got to update. So humans also need to update themselves in terms of their skill. So you can't complain, you can't do anything against change. Mm -hmm. You can only work for change and work with change. So, the, again, the burden is for persons to get ready. Have a mindset that you can't kick against the system. What you yes. can do is to prepare to adapt to the system as it changes. Um, but it has tremendous benefits for you because there are people who, for instance, I, for instance, had to retool myself. You know, I didn't start out as a technologist. I started out as a music musician. You know, yeah, I did music. Yes, I did music for a long time. But in the late 90s, with the rise of computers, I, I saw a computer for the first time and I said to myself, I better learn that stuff. A lot of people were laughing and like, oh, it's a fad. 
But I got myself busy learning how to type, learning, and then I became a programmer. You know, from programming, I now retooled myself and went back to study public policy in school because I wanted to deal with the policy of technology. You understand? So at this point in my life, there's a convergence of my skill, and my skill is now becoming very relevant today. But I could have stayed back and rested on my arms, and I'll be for totally the looking for how to sell, you know, some random things to make money and make life go by. So it's the, just a preparation to deal with the change that this brings and introduces into societies around the world. Now, you, your company really focuses on drones. What are those prevalent areas that we can utilize, you know, that particular the drone technology? Amazing, amazing. So many areas. Um, in the last four or five years, it's been a tremendous increase in just the capacity of what drones can do. I mean, a few years ago, drones were just for fun. You know, just, oh, we can fly something, oh, yay. Then later on, cameras got attached to drones. Oh, yeah, we can fly them for pictures and things. Then later on, the cameras got enhanced. You can use them for videos and all that. Now cameras Exciting got more stuff. enhanced. You understand? Mm -hmm. You can use. Mm -hmm. But drones have surpassed, the use of drones have surpassed just two traditional means. Now, we call ourselves a technology asset management company. In other words, we use drones to help you, act, you know, monitor your assets, assess your assets, audit your assets. Because there are areas, there are places where um, it's risky for humans to go. For instance, if you have a mast, you take telecoms masts, some yes. of those masts, we have co-located masts with all the, um, the antennas there. It's risky for humans to climb and do the, the audits. But with anything drones, can happen. Yeah, with drones, with specialized cameras, you can fly the drones and do the exact audit in less time. Now, how do you audit a power line that runs for 200 kilometers? But with drones, you can do that. If it, it'll take you probably for 10 kilometers, it'll probably take you a week to audit the power line. But with drones, with special cameras, thermal cameras that can see heat at night, heat signatures, you can monitor such power lines over a very short period. In, in 30 minutes, you can do that. How do you do surveys? Before traditional surveys, you have your theodolite, you mount it in one position, mm -hmm. and then to do like, I had a land that's, in, that's about 20 something hectares. It took them one week to, to do survey. the survey, and yeah. trust me, I don't think it was 100% accurate. Uh, of course, it's not 100% accurate. But with a drone and having a LiDAR camera, I can survey that 25 hectare land in one hour, and it will give me less than 0.5 centimeters mm. precision. Mm. Because the point cloud which that generates gives me absolute precision. So, drones. And it gets, if, if it picks up things that it, maybe your regular eye will probably not will pick not up. See, yes, mm. you wouldn't see. And the perspective it gives also gives you. And much more information. If I fly a drone here with a specialized camera, I'm not just gathering specific data. I'm gathering a whole lot of data. So I can come back. It's like casting your net into the sea and you catch all kinds of fish. Then you decide, okay, which one do I want to sell? <laughs> Sharks or, uh, or boku or whatever it is you want to sell. So it does that. So it gives us capacity to gather massive amounts of data that can be used for different But purposes. for future purposes, everything yes. is there. You yeah. can always... And if I consider agriculture, for instance, recently there's been the move to go into... Geomapping. Uh, yeah, geomapping. So those are even the things before you even plant. Now, mm -hmm. when you've even planted, you are, how do you even monitor your farms? How do you monitor the health of your crops? There are drones with cameras, multispectral cameras that can analyze and tell you this part of your farm is not doing well. You understand? Because the health of the leaves can, can show you, the, the images of, of the leaves can tell you mm -hmm. if those plants are dehydrated or something and you need to ha handle or do something to that part. Mm -hmm. You have drones that can spray fertilizer, drones that can spray insecticides, Pesticide, herbicides, yes. yes, all around your farm and environment. You have drones that can even plant now. They are testing some drones that can actually plant seeds. Yes, all around the world. So the amazing things that can be done with drones. So the use case for drones is tremendous. Not to even talk about one that really affects us today, which is surveillance. Tremendous. We do a lot of work in that space where we help people to do surveillance and, of course, some of the local security agencies to do surveillance. Um, in fact, it, it reduces the, the, the amount of foot soldiers you have to put on the ground to go do surveillance work because in a short time, you can sort of fly a drone over um, and have a sort of a quick snapshot of the area you're dealing with before you now mobilize men. So it gives you, we, ref, we try to refer to that as aerial intelligence. Now, aerial intelligence is so vital to ground level intelligence. So 
it helps the security man or security agency be more prepared, more aware of the environments that they're going to deal with. You understand? And we've had several instances in Lagos where, or like the country where, there have been errors in judgments in terms of how they went about attacking. But okay, you know what? We need to go on a quick break now. Right. For the fact I have a first degree in ICT, this conversation <laughs> is so interesting, but we'll, we'll come back we'll shortly. Right. We'll take a quick break. Do stay with us. This conversation you do not want to miss. Thank you for staying with us. We're still talking with Reginald Bassi. All right. We were, before we went on the break, we we're talking about aerial intelligence and its importance here. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's it is such a critical tool to use now. In fact, I've done a case study of a couple of countries where um, the security agencies are leveraging, you know, the drone technology to help them be more efficient. Um, Nigeria is at the cusp of making that kind of decision, and we ought to make that decision properly. Um, for instance, we, we, wouldn't, we have the whole Boko Haram incidents in the Northeast and all that stuff. Exactly. Um, we also know that getting military-graded drones, it's quite expensive. Some of those drones cost about $150 million to buy. We don't have the financial capacity. But what do we have? What are the low-level tools that we have that can help us also gather better intelligence? And that's very available now. And our company, for instance, um, we have very functional partnerships with like major companies that produce these kinds of high quality drones mm -hmm. that are not military grade level that you'll be worried about security and all that security, you know, you know about the security of those weapons in your country. But those things are readily accessible. Low level police, even local governments can have this thing to just to monitor crowd in crowded areas, just to monitor pattern of activities in their local areas. The state governments can use that to monitor activities of citizens. It can even help them make better decisions in terms of, okay, what's the traffic pattern in these areas? You know, how do yes. we deal with, how do we get a quick snapshot of where the clog is in the traffic, you know, pattern you know, in Lagos, for instance, and then you can quickly make a decision where do we divert traffic to and all that. Um, what of, for cases like, now we have firefighting drones, so you don't have to send people to go into the heat of the fire. You can simply send a drone there that has the capacity to carry a nozzle and shoot some kinds of chemical to douse the fire. Then you can have the food people go in and then handle the case. Um, emergency rescue services, hey. What if something happens, a person gets kidnapped? You have drones with thermal cameras that can fly at a very high place and detect movements of humans. And so you, the police can know exactly where to pinpoint you know, the activity or their actions to rescue people. So it's so, I mean, it's so varied, wide and varied, the use of this technology. And it's amazing how a lot of interests have been coming up. But it's now to really put it out there and get persons to know that these things are reachable, they're achievable, and they're things which you can, you know, you can simply just implement for your organization. Yeah. But then, don't you think it's time for Nigeria to really leverage on this particular technology to solve a lot of, like you did mention earlier, the issue of Boko Haram issue situation? At the end of the day, it should help us live a better and easier life. Yeah. 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 I think now. Of course, I, th I know that the army and the police have begun sort of, you know, having the drone units and all that. But I, I think that there needs to be a, a more deliberate and calculated approach. Yes, I to like that word. Implementing, just yes, a drone program for the police, particularly because the police deals with civil security, deals with, you know, um, to have a drone program. LAPD, for instance, they have a drone program and they are training several of their officers on just the technology itself, the, the, the use of the technology, you understand, and just the people are concerned with privacy issues and all that with these, but they're, they're going ahead to train on even the policy behind, you know, regulations for drones. So I think that there needs to be that very deliberate approach by the Nigerian police to establish a drone unit. In fact, I encourage states, for instance, to, um, that's one of the things states can do for the police, local police commands they have. Because if you wait for the whole police to say they, they'll create drone units all around the country, it may not work. But the states can now begin to collaborate with the state police commands to create drone units um, over spe very specific use cases. Because every state's 
concern is quite, is quite peculiar. Quite, yes. So every state can partner with the police and say, okay, how do we leverage this technology to improve your service within our ge geographical area of authority? So those are ways which I think that um, the country can begin to, at least at that level, implement the use. And then, of course, we, when we start talking about agriculture, for instance, I mean, I know that, that the vice president of recent um, went for an agri summit where they went to talk about food sustainability and security in Africa. I mean, there are so many ways we can step in to consult for the government, for instance, in terms of improving, mm -hmm. you know, just the agricultural process. How do you ensure that, you know, all the farmers, because it's very labor intensive to go around huge lands of farm to spray and all that, or huge lands large of farm, hectares of large land. of hectares, yes, too, because sometimes you plant those things, you have to wait till harvest. And at harvest, you discover, oh, a whole swath of my land wasn't doing well. But meanwhile, periodically, you can have assessments on aerial intelligence done over your farm, and you can tell, oh, this part of the farm, something is going on there, we have to attack it. And then you can do sort of a targeted approach to solving the problems. So that at the end of your harvest period, you have a whole farm that has been treated and taken care of effectively. And then your produce can be, you know, sort of guaranteed. So, so much can be done, so much use cases for drones in Nigeria is just um, on just the education of it and getting the public policy makers, decision mm -hmm. makers to sort of say, okay, we are ready to use this, we are ready to learn, we are ready to ensure policy is put in place to enable this technology. To because from what you're it. saying, what, I can, what I'm hearing is if we leverage on these drone technologies, it would help with serve as a preventive measure rather than when you have to deal with crisis management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in both ways, both for, as preventive, and but even in the time of crisis, like I even said, in the time of emergency management, for instance, a building collapses, you are looking for how do you search for persons. There are basic drones that you can use that find heat signatures, because when you have people who are buried there, their body generates heat. So you have certain drones that can determine the heat signatures and tell you that location there is a person, that location there is a person, and you can begin to target rather than trying to lift up heaps and putting the people in further danger mm -hmm. there. So in, that's a crisis period where you can leverage the use of drones. Okay. But as a preventive measure also, drones can be used in construction. It can tell you the integrity of structures. For instance, the third mainland bridge, that drones we can fly to assess that infrastructure and tell you that there are likely breaches to the structure at this point, at this point. We use drones, for instance, to tell people where their roofs have problems. You understand? By flying the drone over and using a specialized camera and tell you, oh, there, there's, there's a leakage, likely leakage here, likely leakage there. Mm -hmm. Because you have a massive 20, 30 story building. It'll take you many man hours to audit this infra the structure itself. Yes, yes. But you can fly drones, and with specialized cameras, those drones can begin to pull up those areas where there is likely structural damage or structural compromise. Uh, and then you can be easily just target those and solve those problems in time. So both as prevent preventive measures, and even in time of crisis, the technology is very, very useful. So in terms of, before we go, in terms of balance, what kind of policies do you think we should adopt such that while the use of things like drone technology of relevance to us, it also doesn't demean or yeah, demean the, I mean, employment for people yeah. and then making, rendering people as good as not necessary in yeah. you know, spaces. Again, you know, these are policy level conversations that must be had. Unfortunately, and it's not, it's not typical to Nigeria, unfortunately around the world, technology sort of usually grows at an, an, a geometric progression. Mm -hmm. And while policy grows at an arithmetic progression, like I, I think that's the way it's said. You know, so usually the growth of technology is faster than the growth of, or the response of governments to the changes. Um, so what really needs to happen, Nigeria has begun to sort of put a framework in place for the, the era of drones, the use of drones, um, but in many ways it's very limiting, particularly limiting to the fact that um, it, it hinders the native growth of the technology itself. Yeah. For instance, we don't just use drones, sell drones, but we also build drones. So we have the capacity to build drones. Now, if you don't look at it from the perspective of benefits, how does this benefit us, rather than from the point of how do we regulate it, 
then there will be a problem. So oftentimes, regulation must start from how do we use this to our benefit, so that that's where you open up the space for even the people whose work is threatened to say, how do I now come into this space mm -hmm. and build better skills to use this technology and grow myself to become more relevant in new, you know, in the, you know, in, in, in the 21st century where more use of technologies will happen. So that's where I think policy needs to look at this in okay. terms of benefits rather than more of regulation. Regulation can come once you've established strong benefits for a technology and then from there you can now um, create a regime where the safety, the safe use of these technologies can be implemented in society. All right, thank you so much. It was fantastic having this conversation with you because at the end of the day, this is the future that we see. Thanks exactly. so much for joining me in the studio. Thank, thank you. you. Thank I, hope you. I, I hope I'll come back someday. To oh, certainly, about. certainly. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. And that's all on One on One. For more educative and informative conversations of this nature, do follow us on Plus TV Africa on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, all on Plus TV Africa. Thank you. Mm -hmm.